She is the Houghton Professor of the Practice of Ministry Studies at Harvard Divinity School. Had wonderful words for us earlier today. I'm not going to take any of her time here to spend time producing her. I do want to say that she's hoping to get done in time to maybe field a few questions or have a little bit of conversation. So you might keep that in mind as, as she goes here. We welcome you on your time. Um, yes, I was horrified to hear that the students had 30 seconds to get to their classes at the end of my last lecture, so I'm going to try to uh, finish up a little quicker than I did last time. I did want to mention this book. I had mentioned it earlier and couldn't quite remember the title, Signs of Peace, um, The Interfaith Letters of Thomas Merton by William Oppel, A-P-E-L. But this has a chat. You can't wait for Dr. Henson's memoir to come out and need a little something to tide you over. Um, there's a wonderful chapter in here about Dr. Henson and his relationship with Thomas Merton. Um, they're just terrific uh, letters that, that this author reprints and then analyzes and discusses. Um, so I commend that to you. Um, this afternoon, I, I gave you a lot of information this morning and raised a lot of themes. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is hopefully let the song speak for itself a little more than I was able to do this morning um, and have us hear uh, some portions of it. I know some of you have your Bibles, and I'm so glad. So um, what, I, what I want to do is... Um, loosely frame this in, in terms of a, a persistent question in the study of Christian spirituality about the relationship of our inner lives and the life of the world around us. Um, but then to, to look uh, closely at four passages of, from the psalm um, and then hopefully have some time uh, for a couple of your questions at the end. So I'll just get started. Um, thank you again. This has been a marvelous day. And uh, Dr. Henson, thank you again for, for your magnificent presentation. This morning we talked about how the lovers in the song praise both what they can see and know about one another and also what remains beyond their reach. They unspool long descriptions of each other's head and hair, eyes and cheeks, legs, arms, and lips that conjure the other before our eyes in images that are vivid and arresting. But they also acknowledge the dimensions of each other that cannot be described so clearly when they ask, where are you? Who are you? Have you seen him whom my soul loves? And when they call out, let me see you, let me hear you, let me hear your voice. The lovers are their bodies, but they are also more than their bodies. And that more is just as worthy of adoration as their beautiful legs and lips and eyes. This hidden, difficult to describe dimension of human being is often named as spirit, as the spiritual dimension of who we are. It is related to the ethical, the intellectual, the imaginative, the moral, the aesthetic, but it is not limited to any one of these, and it is more than all of them together. In the history of Christian spirituality, the spiritual dimension of the human being is often imagined as inside of us, inside of our bodies somehow, at the core of who we are. Like God, the spiritual part of us is hidden from view, but nevertheless real, perhaps the realest thing to be said about us. Um, as Dr. Henson's own story illustrates how that invisible part of us is formed and shaped is crucial to who we are. Our real journey is interior, Thomas Merton wrote in a letter shortly before he died. It is a matter of growth, deepening, and an ever greater surrender to the creative action of love and grace in our hearts. The distinction between inner and outer that is assumed in such descriptions of the spiritual life has come under increased scrutiny over the last several decades as scholarly attention in the study of religion has turned more insistently towards the body and history and the material world. When we claim the spirit as interior, where does that leave the body? Where does it leave the bodies of others, the lives of communities, and the life of the world? Are they within the realm of the spiritual or outside of it? Now there's a long history in Christian spirituality of questioning this distinction between inner and outer life. 
In the late 13th, early 14th century, the great German mystic Meister Eckhart insisted that for the truly detached person, what we all aspire to be, of course, there can be no distinction between inner and outer. For Eckhart, the human being at full stretch is wholly unified and wholly available to God, body, soul, spirit, mind. The anonymous 14th century author of the spiritual classic, The Cloud of Unknowing, also insisted on the artificiality of the distinction between inner and outer. See that in no sense you withdraw into yourself, the author of The Cloud warns, and I do not want you to be outside or above, behind or beside yourself either. The wisdom of these Christian writers is that our life with God is one life, and that all of us, everything that is inside of us and everything that is outside of us, everything above us and everything below us, all belongs in relationship with God. In spite of these critiques from within the traditions of Christian spirituality, however, the image of interior life continues to dominate the discourse of Christian spirituality, and for good reason. There are parts of us that are hidden from view, dialogues going on inside of us that only God can hear. The image of interiority makes a certain kind of sense. It captures what theologian Bernard Lonergan once called the presence to oneself that we must cultivate in order to be authentically present to others. There's a pers persistent worry in Christian thinking, though, that the emphasis on the inner has overwhelmed the outer that also makes a certain kind of sense. Christian theologian Owen Thomas has perhaps put it most strongly. I believe he writes that the focus in Christian spirituality on the inner life has been a mistake ethically. It keeps us focused on ourselves, he argues, and turns us from the body and the material, social, political, and historical world. Thomas feels that the emphasis on the interior as distinct from the outer bodily communal life is particularly prevalent in our own day when I'm spiritual but not religious is a more and more common way to describe a spiritual life that is individualized and privatized, separate from the institutions, traditions, practices, doctrines, and moral codes that are associated with religion. Thomas argues that the dualism of inner and outer should be reversed, viewing the outer life of the body and the historical material world as primary and as a major source of the inner rather than the other way around, a posture he considers more biblical and more Christian. Now how does the Song of Songs view the relationship between our inner lives and the world around us? With its emphasis on the body, does it insist with Owen Thomas on a reversal of the emphasis on inner life at the expense of outer life? With its silence about God and indeed about religion, can it help us navigate a path to God that takes both our inner lives and our outer lives into account? The Song of Songs is a poem, of course, not a rule book or a set of general principles. But throughout the song, the lovers do move back and forth between interior private spaces and the larger world. As they move, they create a larger and larger context for their love one that encompasses the lover's most private interior spaces and the world of contingency in which those spaces exist. The song resists a dualism that places the inner above the outer or the outer above the inner, but rather shows us how to move with agility between them and how that movement shapes our posture toward the world and toward each other. So to help us think about the ways in which the lovers in the song negotiate the relationship between interior and exterior spaces, I'd like to offer meditations on four passages from the song. Uh, one, an account of being called out into the world. Another, an account of the risk that answering that call can bring. An exchange between the lovers that shows how their devotion towards each other shapes their devotion towards the world and an exchange that seeks in the created world for what is hidden.
So the first passage I want to look at, if you have your Bible, is um, the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. The voice of my beloved. Look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking in through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the covert of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. Song is marked by the lover's movements inwards into interior spaces and outwards towards each other and the world. The king has brought me into his chambers, the woman sings in chapter one, and in chapter two, he has brought me into his banqueting house. Mystical interpreters over centuries found themselves attracted to these passages. They seemed to mirror the movement inside into secret interior places that those seeking the presence of God sought to cultivate. The song's lovers have a gift for transforming exterior spaces into private interior spaces. They find quiet places in the great humming world where they can be alone together. As in chapter 1, verse 17, where the woman sings, the beams of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. Unlike many other texts of devotion, however, the song is as concerned with the lover's movement outside as it is with their movement inside. To meet love, the song seems to say, we must step outside into the vineyards and fields or the green spring or the night. In 2 verses 10 through 14, the man stands outside the wall that encloses his beloved and urges her to come outside. She won't be able to know the world as it is, blooming and blossoming, if she remains inside the walls of her house. To step outside is to join the earth as it turns and changes and comes to life again. To step outside is to declare one's allegiance to the life of the world and find one's own life within it. The lover who stands outside the wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice, has been a compelling figure for many readers of the song. The Midrash Rabbah sees in the presence of the lover the presence of God, standing behind the Western Wall in Jerusalem, if you've ever been to the Western Wall. Like the lover, God peers through the window and the gaps in the wall, keeping a watchful eye on the ones God loves. The conviction of many that God's presence is palpable at the Western Wall is undergirded by the Midrash Rabbah's reading of Psalm 2-9. Bernard of Clairvaux also imagines God as one watching from outside the wall, a hidden watcher of hidden things. For Bernard, the wall is the human body taken on by God in the incarnation, and the lattices and windows are the bodily senses and human feelings by which he began to experience all our human needs. Christ's body opened a window for God unto human life, its pleasures, and its pains. By peering through this wall, Bernard wrote, God learned mercy, although the mercy of the Lord is from eternity. By living an embodied human life, God drew near to us and made our concerns God's own. 
As the woman draws us into her story, she urges us to listen. The voice of my beloved, she cries. But before we listen, we must look. Look, she says, he is bounding over the mountains and hills. Look, he is standing behind our wall, looking in our windows. We watch as the beloved, with the speed and agility of a hero, moves across the landscape until he is speaking right into the ear of his lover. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The man echoes the woman's look as he urges her to look also at all the signs of the changing of the seasons. He sings to her a hymn of the turning of the seasons, the awakening of the earth in early spring, and the fragrant blossoming of trees and vines. This is the time of growth, of blossoming, of singing. Listen to the turtle dove, he urges her. Smell the fragrance of the blossoming vines. Taste the figs. The winter is over, the rains are past, the migratory birds have returned to the land. Now is the time to come outside. Now is the time for love to bloom. The man invites the woman to gaze at the world through a wide lens in the first part of his song. But in the second part, he zooms in once more upon a specific part of the landscape the clefts of the rock, the covert of the cliff. Once again, he looks for her in the most hidden of places, like the bramble patch where he found her, his lily, in chapter 2, verse 2. Here she is like a dove, hidden in the crevices of rocks and cliffs. And although he has bounded across mountains and hills with incredible energy and speed, he knows how to slow down how to speak softly and lovingly, how to coax his beloved from her hidden places. Let me see your face, he sings. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. This is a lover who is both strong and gentle, eager and patient. Although he has raced to her side, once he is there, he is able to wait until she is ready. He is able to wait until she is ready to leave her interior places and come outside. The next passage I want to look at um, speaks of the risks of all of this coming outside, and it's um, Song of Songs 5, verses 2 through 8. I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I had put off my garment. How could I put it on again? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved thrust his hand into the opening, and my inmost being yearned for him. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh upon the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and was gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but did not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. Making their rounds in the city, the sentinels found me. They beat me, they wounded me, they took away my mantle, those sentinels of the walls. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell him this, I am faint with love. Now the passage just before this passage, the story of the woman going out into the nighttime by herself um, to search for her lover, is in many ways the, the song's joyful, sensual center. Um, in the fourth chapter, all the verses leading up to this one, um, the man speaks really from inside his ravished heart, piling words on top of words, until finally the woman puts a finger to his lips and calls him to her. 
The lovers call out to one another across chapter four, drawing closer and closer until they are together in the garden that is both the woman's body and the garden where they meet for lovemaking. The, chap the fourth chapter of the song and the first verse of chapter five describe and perform an intensifying pleasure that is aesthetic and erotic at once. I come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spice. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Paired with this joyful passage, however, is this story. The story told by the woman about separation, absence, missed meetings, violence, and desire that is thwarted and left to fester. As in all of the stories she tells in the song, the theme here is her lover's absence and her attempts to overcome it. The story begins with what I think is the song's most striking description of a vibrant interior of life. Um, the woman says, I slept, but my heart was awake. She is being kept awake and watchful by love. Although her body is asleep, something inside her remains wakeful. Some interior part of her keeps listening for the sound of her lover's voice or the sound of his feet in the hallway or his knock at her door. I slept, but my heart was awake. This quiet little sentence gets at something true about us, I think. It's a crucial part of the anthropology of the song. Even when we feel more scattered than present in our own lives, even when we are distracted by many things, even when we are depressed, even when we are asleep, there is some part of us, even if it is a very small part and very hidden, that is awake and waiting. This is the place where love greets and addresses us, the part of us that stays awake, longing and listening, the part of us that is reaching out for love, for God, for our beloved, even when the rest of us is too distracted to notice. The song invites us to learn to be led by that most wakeful part of ourselves, to recognize it excavate it, cultivate it. The song invites us to learn to be kept awake by love. Now soon the woman's inner wakefulness is rewarded. Her lover comes to her, knocking at her door, calling her to let him come inside. But does she leap from her bed and invite him in? No, she hesitates. I've already undressed, she thinks. I've already baked. Do I really want to let him come inside? And as she lies there wondering what to do, her lover reaches through the opening of her door and her whole body responds, my inmost being yearned for him, she says. With her bodily senses now as fully awake as her heart, she rises from her bed and hurries to open the door, her hands dripping with myrrh. I opened to my beloved, she sings, but my beloved had turned and was gone. It's certainly true that the Song of Songs celebrates the pleasures of mutual sexual love. But in this story of hesitation and absence and unfulfilled desire, the song also sings of something true about even the most intimate, mutual, loving relationships. Lovers are not always perfectly receptive to one another. It is not always the case that one lover calls out, come to my garden, and the other answers, I'm coming right now. <laughs> Lovers don't always yearn on the same timetable. The voice of the beloved does not always find an attentive listening ear or a heart that is awake and waiting. Sometimes lovers hesitate a moment too long, and the opportunity for love passes. Along with absence, misunderstanding, and separation, another risk of loving is regret. When she opens the door, her lover is gone. Perhaps she waited too long to open the door, or perhaps he sensed her hesitation and left. My soul failed me when he spoke, the woman says. 
She seems to be remembering how it felt when she heard his voice through the door, how it stirred her, how I wanted him when he spoke, is another translation. Her words express regret and longing. His voice stirred me, but I hesitated, and now he is gone. As in the woman's parallel story in 3, 1 through 5, the woman's longing for her beloved propels her outside into the city streets alone. Unlike the earlier story, though, her search is unsuccessful. I sought him but did not find him. I called him but he gave no answer. Having just left the garden of chapter 4 and the first verse of chapter 5, where lovers' calls are answered with haste, the image of the woman calling and calling and hearing only silence in return is particularly poignant. In this version of the story, the consequences of the woman taking to the streets to look for her lover are graver than they were in the parallel story the woman tells in chapter 3. The story appears twice in the Song of Songs. The longer version is chapter 5. In, in chapter 3, she actually finds him. She finds him and grabs hold of him and brings him into her mother's house. Um, and the mother's house and the mother's room in the Song is, uh, is one of these interior places of intimacy. Um, but in this one, um, not only does she not find him, but the sense of menace that hovered over her encounter with the watchman in the earlier story materializes in acts of violence in this one. They beat me, they wounded me, they took away my mantle, those sentinels of the walls. Now this violent encounter is usually interpreted as an illustration of the risks the woman is willing to take for love and the suffering she is willing to endure for love, and surely it is. But it is also more than that. The natural world the lovers inhabit in the Song of Songs is a garden of delight, where everything, plants, animals, fruits, spices, supports and nurtures the love the lovers share. But just as 5, 2 through 8 is a reminder that love is not without moments of absence, unfulfilled longing, misunderstanding, and hesitation, it is also a reminder that the world in which we live and love is not wholly in our control. We can create, as the lovers of the song do, intimate bowers of delight, interior spaces, but those bowers are not immune to the social and political forces at work in the world. The kinds of unexpected and heartbreaking reversals such as we find in the Book of Lamentations, the lonely city that was once full of people, the princess who has become a vassal, the one with many lovers who has no one to comfort her, are possibilities even at times of great joy in this world of contingency. The Song of Songs celebrates love that flourishes in a peaceful kingdom, but the woman's encounter with the watchman in 5-7 reminds us that it might be otherwise. The beating and stripping of one woman in the song is terrible enough. The terrors of Lamentations are even worse. Women are raped in Zion, chapter 5 of Lamentations says starkly, virgins in the towns of Judah. The brief account in one verse of the attack of the watchman on the woman serves not only to remind us of all that could threaten the lover's joy, but also to remind us that a world in which humans flourish among the plants and animals, a world in which naked vulnerability is sheltered by mutual love, is a world worth our best energies to create and support and protect. The story ends with the woman speaking, as she does at the end of the parallel story in chapter 3, to the women of Jerusalem. But instead of speaking to them of love's demands, she asks them to deliver a message to her beloved. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell him this, I am faint with love. This story, placed alongside the erotic account of the lover's encounter in 5 verse 1, leaves the woman in a state of unfulfilled longing, calling with no answer, Spices with no one to inhale their scent, desire with no fulfillment. We leave the woman faint with love at the end of this story. This image, I am faint with love, recalls Psalm 63, 
where the psalmist cries out to God that my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. For the psalmist, the souls need for God and the body's need for God are one need. The body longs for God just as the soul does, with its attention to both the pleasures and the vulnerabilities of the body. The Song of Songs challenges our tendency to divide the soul from the body, the interior from the exterior, and teaches us to bring all that we are to our life with God. The next passage I want to look at together is um, chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. This is a, a dialogue between the man and the woman. Uh, the man speaks first in verse 15, and then the woman takes over in verse 16. Ah, you are beautiful, my love. Ah, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Ah, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly lovely. Our couch is green, the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are pine. Now, if we're going to reclaim the Song of Songs as a text of devotion, we are going to have to learn how to pray it. And this little poem at the end of the first chapter is a good place to start. In these verses, the lovers find themselves so enraptured with each other that all they can do is breathe in and breathe out one word, beautiful. The man says to the woman, ah, you are beautiful, my love, ah, you are beautiful, your eyes are doves. And the woman replies, speaking directly to the man, ah, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly lovely. The whole orientation of the Song of Songs is captured in these few words. Ah, you are beautiful, my love. Ah, you are beautiful. The Song of Songs is a song of lovers, a song of two people whom love has made attentive to the beauty of the world, lovers for whom the whole world is awash in beauty precisely because they are in love. Ah, you are beautiful, my love. Ah, you are beautiful. Origen of Alexandria warned readers of the Song of Songs that they should only read it if they had overcome sexual desire in their own lives. If not, the text was too dangerous to read. Its erotic power might sweep undisciplined readers away from the right path. But Origen was not always so timorous when it came to engaging the Song of Songs. Fear did not ultimately drive Origen's reading of the song. Love did. And as we talked about this morning in the, his first homily on the song, he urged readers to join with the bride in saying what she says so that you may also hear what she heard. Say what the bride says so that you may hear what she heard. What will we hear if we join the lovers in noticing and praising the beauty all around us, breathing it in and breathing it out? What will we hear if we make the words of the song our own. Ah, you are beautiful, my love. Ah, you are beautiful. Breathing this prayer in and out of our bodies may teach us to expect to find beauty everywhere we look, in the faces of those we love and those we encounter in their wondrous specificity. Ah, you are beautiful, my love. Breathing this prayer may give us a lens to find beauty in unexpected places, in the crowded places of our cities, in the broken places of our lives, in the busy moments of an ordinary day, in the world all around. Ah, you are beautiful. Bernard of Clairvaux insisted that only the touch of the spirit can inspire a song like this, and only personal experience can unfold its meaning. It's not enough to study the song Bernard believed. We have to live it. We have to pray it. We have to breathe it. Ah, you are beautiful, my love. Ah, you are beautiful. The lovers in the Song of Songs find beauty everywhere they look, inside and out, in each other's bodies, in the fields where they pasture their sheep, in the rooms and orchards where they make love, in the turning of the seasons, 
in the animals and trees and hills all around them. Like King Solomon, who lavished the same poetic attention to the hyssop that grows in the wall that he gave to the cedars of Lebanon, no beautiful thing is too small to be adored. The lovers let no beauty go unnoticed, uncelebrated, unpraised. Every time they exhale their reverence and adoration, ah, you are beautiful. They bind themselves ever more deeply, not only to each other, but to the life of the world. This small section of the song ends with the lovers lifting their eyes from each other and looking about them. Our couch is green, the beams of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. The home of these lovers, their bed, is the green world itself, as worthy of reverence as their beautiful bodies and fragrant smells. When they lift their heads to see the cedars and the pines towering over them, their posture of devotion does not change. The song suggests that when we turn with reverence to one another, bringing our whole attention to the other's uniqueness, the other's beauty, soon we will be turning to the world around us with a similar reverence. Soon we will see beauty everywhere we look. The last passage I want to look at with you is the very next uh, couple of verses, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3a. Um, this is, again, the, the exchange between the man and the woman um, continues here. The woman speaks in verse 1, and the man in verse 2, and the apple tree in verse 3. Oh, the apple tree speaks. <laughs> it's getting late in the day. The woman speaks and describes her lover as an apple tree. Okay. <laughs> That's taking the outside world with you a little bit too. Um, okay. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among maidens. As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. Throughout the first chapter of the song, and I would love to have just gone through the first chapter of the song. It's just, um, it's an it's a amazing beginning of a poem. Um, the lovers trade descriptions of each other back and forth, back and forth, until they seem to just finally run out of words. And so they fall into, ah, you are beautiful. Um, and the cascade of images of mares and stallions and bags of myrrh and henna blossoms that we find throughout chapter one for a moment comes to a halt. Ah, you are beautiful. When the exchange of images begins again, at the beginning of this second chapter, the lovers seem to have sharpened their attention, not only to each other's beauties, but to each other's words, and they begin to build their contributions to the dialogue on the words that the other has spoken. In, in two one, the woman describes herself as a flower blooming. I am a rose of Sharon, she sings, a lily of the valleys. This description places her among the pine trees and cedars, the green world she invoked in 117 when she described the place where she meets her lover. She describes herself as a growing, changing, blossoming part of the creation that makes a home for their love. Her lover receives the image she offers of the flower blooming, and then he places it in a more inaccessible place than a valley. As a lily among brambles, he returns, so is my love among maidens. She takes this, and this, um, the man's image of this unexpected blossoming plant growing up uniquely among other more ordinary growth, and she offers it back to him like this. As an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. The lovers' intensifying exchange of words and images is one of the ways they cultivate intimacy across all the boundaries that separate them. The woman's watchful brothers, the walls of her house, the boundaries of their own bodies. Receiving and returning each other's words, they draw close to one another. For this exchange to succeed poetically and erotically, they must seek not only their own pleasure, but the pleasure of the other. They must be playful. They must listen carefully. They must respond organically. 
letting their words grow from the words of the beloved like the trees and flowers they celebrate throughout the poem. These are not easy words of praise, casually exchanged. These are words that build intentionally and creatively on the words of the other, words that catch hold of what has already been said, turn it in a slightly different direction, and increase its possible meanings. Not only do the lovers conjure each other up through their descriptions, they also reach out for one another, seeking to touch one another through language shared and heightened, just as they long to receive and return each other's touch. The pleasure they seek is a shared pleasure they each take responsibility to deepen. The rhythm of receiving a word or an image from the other and then returning it transformed and intensified mirrors the erotic exchange for which the lovers long. The lovers' passionate attention to language and its intimate erotic possibilities echo in the many works of the song's readers. Bernard of Clairvaux spends a lot of time in his sermons on the song considering the power of language and the importance of choosing one's words with care. He exhorts his monks, whom he worries are offending the angels when they doze off during the night office, to sing wisely and seek after the sweetness at the heart of the words of the Psalms by chewing them with the teeth, as it were, of the mind. The monk who prays the words of the psalm with his heart wide awake will cause the angels to respond to him in the words of the Song of Songs and so draw him into its intimate dialogue. Who is this, the angels will ask, coming up from the desert like a column of smoke, breathing of myrrh and frankincense and every perfume the merchant knows? If you pray the psalms with attention, Bernard tells his monks, you might catch the attention of the angels. They will ask themselves who you are, opening the possibility that you are much more than you know yourself to be. To pray for Bernard is to open ourselves to a dialogue in which we encounter the other, and also ourselves, in unexpected ways. A dialogue in which intimacy is cultivated and intensified with every loving exchange. For Bernard, prayer is not a wholly interior act, but one that crosses the boundaries between what is inside us and what is outside. For Bernard, prayer is a mutual act, like the lovemaking in the song. The theme of this particular dialogue is the hiddenness of the extraordinary lover among the ordinary, a lily among brambles, an apple tree among the trees of the wood. This was a favorite theme of Christian commentators because it suggested to them the incarnation of God in Jesus, the divine hidden in the human. Jewish commentators heard in the roses and the lilies a reference to Israel, hidden in the wilderness, yet seen and known and beloved by God. All allegorical interpretations, Jewish and Christian alike, grew out of a commitment to search for meaning hidden among the words of scripture, a search that has its own erotic dimension. As that passionate reader of scripture, Augustine of Hippo, insisted, hidden meanings are found with more pleasure than meanings that simply lie on the surface waiting to be apprehended. Everyone knows, he wrote in On Christian Doctrine, that what is sought with difficulty is discovered with more pleasure. It's a good word to the students. It's hard, but what is sought with difficulty is discovered with more pleasure. It is the search itself that lures one on, the search itself in which the pleasures of interpretation are found. The theme of hiddenness, so beloved of the authors and the readers of the Song of Songs, also recalls the hiddenness of the song among the books of the Bible and the hiddenness of God in the poem. Just as one does not expect to find an apple tree in the woods or a lily among the brambles, we do not expect to find an erotic poem tucked away between the pragmatic Ecclesiastes and the monumental Isaiah. We do not expect to find God between the lines of a poem celebrating the beauties of the human body, the bright ache of sexual desire, and the pleasures of lovemaking. But why not? 
One of the things we might learn if we pray this poem of devotion is that it is we who have hidden ourselves from God, refusing to look for God in embodied human life. Like Adam and Eve cowering naked in the shadows of the garden, we have hidden from God, believing that God will despise our nakedness, our desire, our vulnerability. But God made us this way, naked and vulnerable and longing for intimacy. Perhaps this is part of what it means to be made in the image of God, to long to cross the distance between ourselves and another, to cultivate love in the spaces between us to make a path between our secret, hidden, inner lives and the life of the world God created and called good. In his 74th sermon on the Song of Songs, Bernard of Clairvaux describes searching for God both out inside and outside of himself. If I looked outside myself, he writes, I saw God stretching beyond the furthest I could see. And if I looked within, he was yet further within. Our life with God, Bernard had learned, both from the song and from his own experience, is not a matter of choosing <coughs> inner life over outer life, or outer life over inner life. It is a matter of living with our hearts wide open, our ears attuned both to the language of the earth and the language of the angels. It is a matter of cultivating the agility to move back and forth between our dialogue with ourselves and our dialogue with others, between the interior stirrings of our desire for God and the public demands of human life and community, between our wakeful heart and our response to the knock that comes unexpectedly in the night. The life inside us and the life around us are one life, the life God has given us with all of its pleasures and pains, risks and blessings. As Bernard knew and the song teaches, we cannot go deeply in enough inside or far enough outside to know God or each other or even ourselves fully. But we can be lured as the lovers in the song are by beauty and mystery to keep reaching further in and further out. This is the life that is fully alive and such life, Saint Irenaeus once said, is the very glory of God. Thank you very much. Great, we have about 10 minutes. So I'm eager to hear what's on your mind after a day of pondering the Song of Songs. Um, several people came up to me during the breaks and said, I've been avoiding the Song of Songs. <laughs> and I have to admit, I, when I was asked to write this commentary, I thought, you know, as our friend Matthew Kelty said, huh, what do I know about the Song of Songs? Um, it is a book that we have neglected, um, unless you're very lucky and, and you are a pastor or you go to a church or you, someone has invited you into this marvelous book. Um, but it's a book that's ready to be reclaimed. I think, in our prayer and in our liturgy and in our conversation and in our devotion. Um, so I'm eager to hear your questions about anything I've said or just anything you've read in the song. Uh, I was struck as I read it uh, this morning before I came and the repetitions of your reinforcement, yeah. how many times the great yeah. literary figures in Western culture yeah. picked up the words of yeah. this book and made them part of the way we think. Yeah. That is, Absolutely. dedicated people. And people who sing songs, yes, uh, know the lyrics of this. Uh, it's striking, and I'm glad you urged me to get that into the Yes. Yeah, the great comment um, that we have a literature professor here who has noticed how how much the images of the Song of Songs permeate Western literature. And in fact, I'm, I'm teaching a course right now with a colleague of mine who studies uh, India, Tamil speaking India, and he's doing a study of the Song of Songs in comparison with poetry and in, in, in Tamil. In Tamil. Um, so there's there's literary parallels all over the place. But you're right. Even if we even if we've been avoiding it. Kind of seeps in through the culture. 
um, oh, the, the spices and, and all the, the lovely images. And, and of course, set me as a seal upon your heart. It means some of these really famous, famous passages. Arise, my love, my fair and come away. It is a book that, that we receive in a lot of different ways through art and literature and music. And um, Glenn was telling me today of a marvelous chuppah he saw, a, a weaver had made, that had, uh, you know, in one piece of fabric, um, an, a literal reading of the Song of Songs, and then a spiritual reading of the Song of Songs up above it, but all in the same piece of cloth, which I think really captures something true about this book, um, and the way it's been read and, and used in, in Christian faith and Judaism. Um, thank you. Other comments or questions? Yes? This may be dangerous, but are the lovers married? Oh, what a good question. <laughs> um, you know, the, the image bride uh, and bridegroom, you know, those images appear, but it doesn't seem to be a poem so much about marriage. <laughs> as it, uh, it, you know, uh, there are lots of theories about where the song comes from, and the one I'm most convinced by is that it's probably an, a kind of anthology of, of poetry that somebody who just had, you know, some literary genius who had an ear for the resonances between them kind of shaped into a whole... Um, but some, there's some theories that say, well, it comes from fertility liturgies of, you know, ancient Mesopotamia. There's, there are um, images on pots and things that, that, you know, you see the, the image of the right hand under her head and her left hand holding her that comes up in the Song of Songs. Um, but it really doesn't seem to be about fertility or procreation or even marriage so much, although it is about... A, an exclusive relationship. There's a great, you know, of course, for a long time people thought Solomon wrote it. And one of the reasons that was given for Solomon's authorship was, well, in First Kings it says he has all these concubines and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of concubines and princesses and wives and things. And there's one part at the end where the the man seems to be making, poking a little fun at Solomon. He's like, you can keep your vast vineyards, you know, my my vineyard, my very own is for me. And he, he says, you know, she she's my only one. And the woman says, you know, my beloved belongs to me and I belong to him. I mean, there is this sense of both mutuality and exclusivity, that this, this is the one person for me. Um, and it's, you know, it's a natural to be read in weddings, certainly. There's also a little wedding poem in the song. It's in, um, it's at the end of, Chapter three and, and King Solomon's wedding palanquin comes, you know, making its stately way across the landscape. And there's lots of debate about, you know, where this comes from. But what I love about this wedding poem is, um, well, there's also this call to come out, daughters of Jerusalem, come out, come out and look, and look at King Solomon um, at the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. And it's, you know, that's something very worth, worth looking at. You know, a person who is satisfied, joyful on his wedding day, glad of heart. Um, and it's, it's not a way, you know, it's probably put in there just to heighten the, the sense of the lovers meeting each other um, and, and a sense of their love and their commitment to each other. Um, but it's, I think it's not about marriage as it is so much about erotic laws. Given that it's a subject, uh, what do you recommend that our students uh, do about it? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's some great opportunities. Yeah, know. absolutely. I mean, I, I think, well, first of all, I think to really familiarize yourself with it and pray it and you know, see see what happens when you make yourself vulnerable to this song. It's it's a, I have found it just completely remarkable to to live with it over the past year or so. Um, I think Diane Bergant, uh, the the commentator I, I referred to in my first lecture, you know, she says this is this is incarnational theology. This is about you know embodied human love, and we can it it's wonderful to you know, read it, read these allegorical interpretations and to imagine this being about God and the soul or Christ and the church. But she says you don't have to do that to get a theological reading out of this because this is, you know, this is about, you know, that, that God dwells at the very heart of the human endeavor. And what is more human than our, our 
attraction and desire for one another and all the vulnerabilities that come with that, the longing to be loved, the longing to be known, um, and how difficult it is to know and be known, as this poem talks about. I think there are so many, and I think it's also a great poem to talk about in relation to marriage, because it is about an exclusive, committed relationship. Um, but I think it's also an opportunity to help people think about the, the challenges that arise in our lives by virtue of our embodiment every day. And many of those have to do with our relationships, with our identities, with our vulnerability in relation to desire. Um, and it's a way to bring these things back into Christian conversation um, and back into worship and back into our lives as church. And I look forward to see what you're going to do with that. No, you know, um, he died just a few weeks ago, and he I never did get to share this with him, and I think he would have liked it. I he I think he was teasing me. <laughs> um, but I did I did kind of love his response because you know the whole question of who does this song belong to and what kind of you know you have to be in a relationship with somebody in order to pray it, in order to understand it. And he was saying, you know, I'm, I've been praying this for 50 years. I know more about it than you do, who, you who have been in a relationship with somebody. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, it's good to, to um, imagine all the different contexts into which this song can speak. Yes. You've used the word embodiment several times yeah. and talked about it in your lecture. Can you say just a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think um, I'm talking about just our lives in our bodies, and it's very hard to find language to talk about it. I think we're, or at least I am so, I think, influenced by Plato, you know, and the Greeks who had this sense of the essence of the human person is caught in the body like an oyster in a shell, and it will be a great day when we can shuck it off and, you know, be Holy Spirit. Um, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Um, but, you know, reading the song and thinking about um, embodiment, um, one of the things that strikes me is that, you know, God made us this way, and, and that one of the things we learn by attending more closely to our bodies is that, you know, God has placed us in each other's care. That's, I think that's some knowledge we can come to about God from, from studying our, our bodies and our embodiment and our vulnerabilities. Um, nobody is so strong or so healthy or so well dressed or you know so splendid that they that they don't need other people because of the vulnerability of their embodiment. And and embodiment is one of the things, as I said this morning, that we genuinely share. We're so different from each other in so many ways, um, but we are all. Um, embodied, we are all made vulnerable by our bodies, we are all both strong and vulnerable and um, by virtue of, of this marvelous way we were made, fearfully and wonderfully made, as the psalmist says. Um, and I think, you know, more attention to that is going to tell us more about God as creator. One more, one more. Well, you all have been very kind and patient today, and um, I thank you and look forward to meeting you at dinner and, and having some more conversation. Thank you so much.